but welcome. It's good to see you. It's good to be here. And it's good to see you on the screen as well. I hope that you can now hear me properly. It is Sunday, the 13th of December, and we're going to light our candle of peace. On the night that Jesus was born, the angels appeared to the shepherds who were watching over the sheep, and they declared glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favour rests. And Jesus himself speaks of peace. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Our world today needs peace. These are anxious times right now. I mean, whatever your political leanings, whether you're pro or anti-Brexit, uh, whether you're pro-Trump or anti-Trump, we cannot help but be anxious about the state of our world and the, the economic uncertainty that seems to be staring us in the face, exacerbated by COVID. We've seen jobs lost, homes at risk, people struggling to feed themselves and their children. These are anxious times. Our world needs more than ever to know the peace of God, the peace proclaimed by the angels and given by Jesus. So this week, let's make it our mission to be agents of peace. It sounds simple. Actually, as I started to think this through, I started to realize how difficult this would be. You know, when we feel stressed in the supermarket queue, let's bring God's peace into that situation. Bless the poor person on the checkout with a smile and a kind word. When frustration and impatience makes you want to snap, instead, bite your tongue and offer a kind word, an encouraging word. When you want to rush, breathe deeply. Should have read this before I started setting up this morning. And ask God for his peace. You'll stand out a mile in our stressed and harassed world. What a wonderful witness, sharing the peace of God wherever we go, but what a huge, huge challenge. We're going to pray now. I hope you'll uh, take my poetic license. It's a prayer based on the words of a famous hymn. Uh, the hymn is Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. And I have taken it and adapted it. You may think I've butchered it, uh, but to fit our situation. So let's pray. Father God, make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. And where there's despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Make me an instrument of your peace. Where there are long supermarket queues, let me bring a smile. Where there are traffic jams, help me let others out ahead of me. When the delivery man brings my parcel late, let me bring gratitude for their hard work. Where people are stressed, let me bring calm where there are arguments and fallouts, let me bring reconciliation. Where people are anxious and worried, help me bring your peace. God of peace, help me to carry your peace out into the world, that I would reflect Jesus, the light of the world, to everyone I come into contact with. Help me to bring blessing, joy, hope, love and peace in all that I do. Amen. Amen. We're going to watch now the Advent candle lighting the candle of peace.
We light this flame as one of many that will shine this day in places unknown to us and very different to our own. Joining us with those who might otherwise be strangers to declare our common hope through the one whose coming unites us. This fragile beacon flickers amidst a world of turmoil whose narratives will invade us and at times leave their scar. And like this flame, our minds at times might feel fragile and restless as we are disturbed by the winds of uncertainty and conflict. But we are not deceived by this flame's frailty, for it speaks of that which is immeasurable and certain. The peace of God is not confined or contained by human circumstance. Its source and foundation is deeper than the events of this world. And though we cannot deny that conflicts rage within us and without, we will seek peace. Peace with one another and peace within ourselves. For ours is a hope that will remain when this world's conflicts are finally overcome. A hope that equips us to wait in calm assurance. Oh, people on Zoom, you just missed out on something then. Shall we say thank you to Trish, everyone? Watching Trish trying to blow a match out through her mask was the funniest thing. <laughs> yes, it does. It shows how much, the, how well the mask works. We're going to play a carol now. Um, a Christmas I know that was the Advent candle. Please don't write in angry of Southwell. Uh, it, we've just lit the Advent candle, but we're going to sing a Christmas song. Uh, we're going to sing a song that has the wonderful line, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. A wonderful carol, hark the herald angels sing. So if you're at home, feel free to sing your heads off as long as you're on mute. And uh, for everyone here, we'll just have to listen to it.
um, notices. Some notices for us this morning, church. A hu- I still can't see you. You'll gradually come back into focus. A huge thank you for all of your donations to the Fieldings Care Home. Um, it's been incredible, uh, the amount of stuff. But if you still have some stuff to deliver to me, you have until Tuesday to get it to me. On Wednesday, it's either going to be delivered or collected. But seriously, a huge, huge thank you to all of you. You are going to bring some serious hope, joy, peace and love into the lives of some people for whom life is really a hard struggle right now. Uh, So I genuinely, I genuinely pray God's blessing on you for your generosity. And may our gifts really bring some light in a dark time. Last week at the end of the service, I went upstairs for coffee time and you'd all gone. You'd all gone. It's fine. It's not a problem. Uh, Chris and I were there and we had a lovely chat and a catch up. Uh, But just to say, I will be on Zoom after the service as usual, but please, that doesn't mean that you have to be there. Uh, But it means if you want to join in, uh, you can. Um, You can stay on uh, for a chat and a coffee um, and I will be there, but please don't feel that means you have to. Next week is our nativity service. It will be, I have planned, an interactive service of fun-filled worship. That's what I've written down here anyway. An interactive service of fun-filled worship, but safe, it will be safe. Um, It will be socially distanced, but hopefully it will be fun. There are things that you will be able to join in with both here in the church building and on Zoom. But it means, I'm speaking specifically to you guys who are at home now, if you want to join in at home with the interactive stuff, you must let Sue know. So for this week only, for this week only, if you plan to be in church next week, joining in the service in the building, you must book in with Sue as usual by Thursday lunchtime. Okay, and then I will have your stuff ready for you here when you arrive. But if you would like a pack of stuff delivered to your home so that you can join in with the interactive bits of the service at home, then please also book in with Sue by Thursday lunchtime to request a pack. I would hate for you to miss out because you haven't requested a pack. You see, that means that Thursday afternoon, I will know how many interactive packs I'm putting together. And Friday, I can drive round and deliver them to you so that you can have them all ready for Sunday. So next week, please do wear uh, your your Christmas jumpers, your Christmas hats, your tinsel, your baubles, both at home and in church. It will be great to see you all. Okay, so next week, the 20th, if you're in church or at home, remember to either book your slot in the church, book your seat in the church or book your delivery. Christmas Day, our Christmas Day service. Oh, that seems to be moving up. You've literally just got my chin now. There you go, that's a bit better. Um, Christmas Day will be online only. Uh, And I'm really sorry, but if you don't join us for the live Zoom on Christmas morning, it won't be recorded and put up online later. I don't fancy spending my Christmas afternoon editing and uploading. So it will be live on Christmas morning and then gone forever. Okay, so if you usually watch the recording later on the day and you want to join us, and I'm thinking particularly perhaps of your friend Trish, who's I know has been uh, very involved, and, and other friends of ours who, through the candles that we sent out, have started watching our services, uh, you maybe invite them to have the Zoom uh, details if they want to join us on uh, live on Christmas morning. 27th of December, we'll be back in church and online book in as usual and on Sunday the 3rd of January I have a real treat for you uh the very wonderful David Driscoll will be bringing our message to us and Sandy is going to be leading our service (laughs) but now it's over to Pete who's going to share his testimony so I'm going to mute this one and unmute that one morning everybody I'm hanging on to this because I'm falling apart this year. I, two days ago, I started with acute labyrinthitis, so that's an inner ear disturbance and makes you stagger about and you get dizzy spells and things. So if I stagger about or fall over, I don't panic. It's only a short-lived attack, okay? Right, so don't worry about that. 
We've had a few of these um, COVID uh, stories from members of the church, and so I'll try not to be uh, repetitive, So, and I'll try not to be too lengthy, so here goes. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Sounds familiar. Charles Dickens got it right, the opening lines of uh, A Tale of Two Cities. He could have been talking about this year, I think. Anyway, it all started so well, didn't it? 2020, I'm talking about. It certainly did, Patricia and myself, we were very lucky. We've been very lucky throughout. Uh, in January, thanks to Tricia's planning, we, st we spent 10 glorious days in Costa Rica. The people there, the coast, the forest, the volcanoes, all lived up to our expectations. Our resort was superb. The highlight of the entire holiday were the three-toed sloths that Costa Rica is famous for. Uh, we saw two of them hanging upside down on exposed branches, low exposed branches, uh, near the entrance to our uh, resort, doing what sloths do, which is basically they do nothing, um, but do it very slowly. And so they, they were in character. And we also saw two others, a mum and a little tiny baby. Um, the baby was sort of no bigger than that, with a little head hardly bigger than a ping pong ball. And they were on the ground uh, just outside the bar of our resort. They were en route from one tree to another and sensibly detoured via the bar. So we had a great time. We continued to uh, be lucky and enjoy ourselves when we returned from that holiday. Um, we enjoyed a busy social life, walking with friends, um, dinner parties, golf, gardening, and of course a lovely church life where you could actually worship by singing out loud and hugging one another. Trish was actively involved with the subtle Syrian refugees. All was well. We hardly noticed a sort of minor announcement late on in the news uh, on the evening TV about some trivial bug that had taken off in China. Uh, we weren't really worried about that. In a place the size of China, trivial bugs just take off and land all the time, right? Wrong. March 17th came along and saw us going into social isolation. Because of our advanced years, that was, the government's opinion, not ours. We were considered too old and vulnerable to help other people and to be in need of help and care ourselves. That wasn't particularly good for our morale. Strange new words and phrases came into our vocabulary. Lockdown, furloughing, sounds like something that goes on at Ascot or Aintree, but furloughing. Um, social isolation, which seemed more like anti-social isolation to me. Click and collect at the supermarket. All strange words and phrases. Black lines started appearing on our calendar, indicating cancelled engagements. Supermarket food was delivered to our front door by our lovely neighbour. And our family mutated from Homo sapiens to Homo virtualis at the other end of a Zoom screen. Zoom, another strange word. I wasn't designed for this kind of lifestyle, but uh, the absence of choice forced it upon us. We missed our 50th year medical school reunion, a real disappointment, particularly as Trisha put so much work into organizing it. Hopefully we'll have a 51st this coming year. Our golden wedding celebration shrank and uh, ended up as a quiet meal for two uh, in a local gastro pub with a complimentary bottle of champagne thanks to our boys. Thank you, boys. But in the midst of all this trouble and strangeness, God was kind to us. Trish and myself were lucky. We didn't have to worry about kids going to school and being educated. We didn't have to worry about kids going to university and being educated. Our own children had those worries and we ourselves were concerned for our four lovely granddaughters but they seemed to manage. The weather was beautiful at this time, thanks to the Lord. We enjoyed our home, we enjoyed our garden and local walks as best we could. We're grateful that COVID-19 has so far passed us by. The birds were singing louder, the birds were singing longer. The roads were quieter, the air was cleaner, there was an absence of vapor trails in the sky. 
Neighbours helped each other. Frontline medical staff and other essential workers were really appreciated for the work they do. The local supermarket girl in the checkout was regarded as a hero stroke heroine by all, and justifiably so. And the RHS reckoned that three million people started gardening at this time for the first time in their lives. With some easing of lockdown, we were lucky again, Trish and myself, we achieved a delightful, albeit socially distanced family holiday in Kent. And Trish and I afterwards managed to get away for a few short breaks ourselves. On November the 5th, instead of celebrating that famous Yorkshireman Guy Fawkes' attempts to blow up Parliament and King James I, that's James VI with um, Louise's benefit. Instead of sort of getting rid of the King and uh, numerous parliamentarians and celebrating his capture and that, that deed not happening, um, we celebrated the onset of lockdown too. So November the 5th, 2020 is famous for lockdown too. Now we're out of lockdown too, and in tier three, it's all happening. We can go wild and live it up by walking in the cold and the rain in a group of six, not two. We can drink coffee with cakes and eat bait and butties outdoors in near zero temperatures. How bad would that be without global warming? And we can worship in our cold, drafty, but much loved SBC with masks and social distancing. Despite tens of thousands of COVID related deaths in this country and millions worldwide, Mourning families all over the place, job losses, economic uncertainties, Dominic Cousins, Laura Koonsberg, and Brexit negotiations. We must not forget that in the midst of all this trial and tribulation, God does love us all despite what we are. And this, in the midst of all these bad things, good things have and are still happening. Truly, it is the best of times is the worst of times. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. Where are we now? Ah, yes, we're going to pray now. We're going to just spend a little bit of time in prayer. And um, the words, are the words of the Lord's Prayer going to come up on the screen, Barry, or are we praying as we remember them? Are the words of the Lord's Prayer coming up on the screen or are we just praying them as we remember them? We're going to pray. We don't often pray uh, just the Lord's Prayer outright. We tend, we'll pray prayers based on it or built around it. But I thought today it would be nice. Now, you must only use your indoor voices, which some of us, Dave, I know they're a bit, bit louder than others. But you mustn't raise your voice. Uh, just pray to God uh, and to yourself. How are we off, Barry? Hey, hey marvellous. Full crumbs. I'm glad I've got mine on a bit of paper. <laughs> I'd be in trouble otherwise if I was looking on that screen. Okay, let me get out of your way so you can see the words and we'll pray together. Our Father, who art oh, in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Got a bit of a challenge for you, church, if you should like to take it up. We cannot sing at the moment. We don't know how long that's going to go on for, um, at least until, well, the majority of us, I would imagine, have been vaccinated. Um, uh, it's going to be quite a while. They reckon Easter before we're, as a conservative estimate of when we could be sort of back to normal. Of course, amazing now, much clearer I speak without a mask on. Um, <clears throat> so we can't sing, so what can we do? We can sign. So 
I looked up this week, uh, if you have YouTube, if you have access to YouTube and you type in the Lord's Prayer, British Sign Language. Now make sure you either type in BSL or British Sign Language because there's different sign language, okay? And I'm teaching myself, trying to learn the Lord's Prayer in British Sign Language. So even though we can't sing, we'll be able to sign it. I've got so far as, do you wanna see how far I've got? So our, I have to stand on tiptoes because you can't necessarily see my hands on there. So it's a circle with two hands, our and father is two fingers like that together and you, and you tap them, father. Our Father, and then it's who art in heaven. That's as far as I've got so far, but isn't that good? So, so our Father, who art in heaven. Brilliant. Now, so what, what, what I want us to do is basically to learn a little bit more of that and a little bit more of that and a little bit more of that so that when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we might not be able to sing and do other things, but we'll be able to sign it together. I can only, I, I, I know a little bit more in pieces because I've watched it a few times, but I know the first line, the first line is really in there. So if we can get the second line in there, you know, and gradually build it up, that'll be really good. Um, and also incredibly inclusive if people who are hard of hearing come to our church and we can sign our prayers and wouldn't that be wonderful so that is a challenge for you British Sign Language I can put a link to it on our Facebook page to the one that I've been using if you would like Phew. if you have your Bibles with you please turn to Luke chapter 2 and we're going to start at verse 8 the problem I've got at the minute is because I'm using all of my screens I have absolutely zero idea what time it is no idea if we're running on time or late or early or whatever but if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. Not a rustle of paper was heard amongst them. Ah, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they'd seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Thank you, brilliant Barry. Um, I often wonder, I've said this to you before, um, that if we've become so used to the nativity story that we miss so much of its significance. Because from very small children, we're sort of dressed up in tea towels, aren't we? Both at school and at church. And we hear this story many times of Mary and Joseph traveling to Bethlehem on a little donkey. Uh, there's no room at the inn. And the baby is born in a stable and shepherds and wise men come and worship him and bring their gifts. And all the while, there's a giant glowing star above the manger. And we get to the point, if we're not careful, that we, we don't actually know what is scripture and what is myth and what is embellishment and what is storytelling. It all becomes rolled into one. And so, and when we do go back to the scriptures, like we're going to do this morning, we feel like we know the story so well that actually we miss the stuff. That if we were hearing this for the first time, we'd be like, hold on a minute, what? Sorry? Say that bit again? It, it's become so well known to us, so familiar to us. 
But you see, this is the event that changed the whole of human history. This is the event that changed the whole of cosmic history. So important was this event that we reset all of our calendars and count our years from this event. The fact that today we stand in 2020 means that it's actually 2020 years ago, but give or take a year or two, or four or seven, depending on who you read, because the people calculating it got it a bit wrong. But it's round about 2020 years since this actual real life event actually took place in our world in a tiny place in Israel called Bethlehem. So let's have a look at our passage this morning. I mean, over the last two weeks, we looked at this incredible event first from Mary's point of view, and we were encouraged, weren't we, to trust God and to give our yes to God, just like Mary did. Not an impetuous, um, a blind faith, but a sensible and rational decision, knowing that our yes doesn't mean that life will be all plain sailing because God is in it. Actually, quite the opposite. You know, as God asks us to stand up against injustice, to stand up for the poor, to play our part in challenging the power structures that cause or contribute to poverty, addiction, injustice and oppression, then actually we will face opposition. We will have pushback. Things will be difficult. But what an incredible privilege it will be to partner with God, to bring his gospel, to bring Jesus to our town, to our friends, to our family. Then last week we looked at Joseph, so often overlooked and yet a vital part of the story, a linchpin, quiet, solid, trusting and trustworthy, reliable, honest a true old-fashioned hero, not much in the way of glitz or glamour, and yet the Bible calls him a good man, the man that God trusted to raise his only son. And this week we're going to look at another group of people that either get overlooked or sort of over-romanticised, the shepherds. Well, surprisingly, Shepherds were not very well thought of at the time. And I was surprised, genuinely surprised to find that out because, well, King David, you know, the, the best king that Israel ever had, um, the one, the king that they all look back to as being, you know, the glory days when Israel were at their best. Well, before David was a king, he was a shepherd. He's often called the shepherd king. And Jesus would go on to refer to himself as the good shepherds. But shepherds at this point in history were really not well thought of. They were mostly nomadic. They traveled and lived outside with the sheep and they'd be away from their families, their villages, their communities for days and weeks at a time. And uh, it was their job they would kind of lead the sheep to try and find good grazing. Please don't imagine that Israel 2,000 or so years ago that looked like the English countryside with rolling green hills um, at good for grazing. The shepherds would have had to travel all around, keep moving to try and find areas of good grazing and then a safe place to rest with the sheep at night to try and keep the sheep safe from wild animals. These would have probably been fairly rugged men um, we know, again, referring to King David, when he was a shepherd, he wrote about um, fighting bears and lions to protect himself and protect the sheep. Now, I don't know if these more modern shepherds still had to do that sometimes, but they would certainly have had to protect the sheep from wolves and from thieves and things like that. But shepherds, they would have been a bit dirty, smelly, the low-skilled, low-paid workers of their day. They were very much looked down on, outside of the community, and considered pretty shady, somewhat disreputable people. Uh, when you were at school, you know, when they ask you, what do you want to be? I doubt if very many people would have written shepherd. 
But on this night, on the hills overlooking Bethlehem, the shepherds, well, they're just doing what they do. They're watching the sheep. They're doing their job. When all of a sudden an angel appears and the glory of the Lord shone around them. I can't imagine what that must have looked like or felt like. But it must have been incredible because these rugged, tough, roughy, toughy, strong men are terrified. I wonder if I asked you now uh, to try uh, and remember, try and identify the best moment of your life so far. Is there something that comes to mind or are there too many to choose from? Um, what would you say? Can you put your finger on, on a moment when you thought life doesn't get better than this and then try and remember how you felt did it feel like your heart would burst remember how it felt to be so excited and so incredibly overwhelmed by emotion and then multiply that excitement and emotion by a million because the angels here are not just announcing the best day in your life or the best day in the life of the shepherds but they're announcing the best day in the history of the whole world ever. The, the best day in the history of the whole created cosmos. The savior of the world has been born. The long awaited Messiah, hallelujah. I do need to put in a caveat and an apology here. I got so excited writing this, I'm actually exhausted even, and I, and, and, and I am likely to get carried away as we get through it. So if I could have an occasional quiet hallelujah every so often would make me feel so much better. Um, I know we're Baptists, but you know, try and let feel the excitement of the moment. You know, the angels have overspilled from heaven. The praise and the joy and the wonderment cannot be contained and it overflows onto this mountainside and the shepherds are invited to join in and get involved in this incredible moment in history. Can you imagine what it must have been like? Can you imagine what it must have felt like to be caught up in that overflow of exciting, angelic, heavenly, effervescent praise and worship to God? And then the angels tell the shepherds, this is how you will know that what we are telling you is true. This is the sign that this baby, this king of the whole world, will be wrapped in swaddling bands and laid in a manger in an animal's feeding trough. Sorry, what? But the shepherds are so caught up in the joy and the excitement and the praise of the angels that they just leave everything behind and they rush. It says they hurry, they race to Bethlehem in the middle of the night. It's like, ah, oh, the sheep can wait, but the Messiah, the savior of the whole world, he can't wait. And you can sense their excitement and their enthusiasm as they hurry to Bethlehem. And when they get there, when they get there, our passage simply says, they find Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Sometimes wonder if Mary and Joseph wished the shepherds hadn't been in quite so much of a hurry and had let them get a bit of sleep first. But I really do wonder what difference that first night made to Mary and Joseph. Just think about this for a minute. Up till now, Mary knew this child was from God. And Joseph had been told by an angel in a dream that this child was from God and he trusted Mary and he trusted God and he chose to take his place in the events of history. But their family don't know, their friends don't know, their village doesn't know, and the shame and scandal and whispers and slammed doors following them everywhere. And now the baby is born and in the middle of the night, when Jesus has just been born, a ragtag bunch of shepherds arrive with tales of angels singing praise to God and announcements that the baby is the Messiah, that this baby is the savior of the world. I wonder what that would have been like for Mary and Joseph, hearing these truths, uh, these affirmations of who their son was repeated back to them. Another angelic announcement. And now more people know and believe the wonderful truth about their son. Shepherds, the first to believe and, and for the shepherds it's exactly as they've been told it's exactly as the angels said it is true it's ridiculous it's insane 
the king of kings and the lord of lords god himself sleeping in an animal's feeding trough but it is true it is exactly as the angels told them it would be and the shepherds are so convinced they're so excited at what they've seen and heard that it starts to bubble up and overflow from them and the next thing in our passage we see is that they go and they tell everyone who's going to listen to them uh, what they've seen and what they've heard and they tell them the truth of who this baby is and the passage says that the people were amazed all who heard them were amazed. But just look at the transformation of the shepherds. From outsiders, outside the village, outside the community, up on the hill with the sheep, to messengers telling anyone and everyone who would listen what they have seen and what they have heard. And the difference in them is these shepherds have come face to face with the savior of the world and they believe, and they are transformed. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you. And our passage says that the shepherds then return to their work. They return to the fields, to the sheep, glorifying and praising God. They cannot stop praising God. They can't stop glorifying him because of everything that they've seen and heard. It's like a champagne bottle once the cork is out, they can't get it back in. They're overflowing with the praise. Oh God, help us to hear the words of the angels again today. Help us to be caught up in the excitement and the truth of their message. And church, will we allow that message to transform us? Will we let the truth of what we've heard and seen overflow from us like the shepherds did? That we would be so excited that we have to tell people that we have no choice. I mean, have you ever had something, have you ever heard uh, something so exciting that you just couldn't keep it to yourself? You know, that you had to phone someone or knock on their door or text them whatever and say, you will never guess what. Have you just thought of something that was that exciting when you had a moment like that? I think for us, um, it was when we found out we were having each of our boys. Was that exciting? We just had to tell people. And um, when MINREC, the Ministerial Recognition Committee, um, recognised my calling to be a Baptist minister, when I got the yes, that was so exciting, so huge. We were so excited, we were telling everyone who would listen, even people who really didn't care. Um, I wonder what for you have been the times when you just had to share your news. You couldn't keep it in because you knew that you would physically explode if you had to keep this news to yourself. See, that's what happened to the shepherds when they were carried along by the angels' excitement and praise and worship, and they raced to Bethlehem. And when they saw that it was exactly as they'd been told, they had to tell everyone, and people were amazed at what they heard. Oh God, I wanna be a shepherd. <laughs> I never wanted to be a shepherd before. You know, when the parts for the nativity plays over the many years were being handed out, I wanted to be Mary or the angel. I think I'd make quite a wonderful angel. Or the star, I could be a star and twinkle. I could do a good job of twinkling. Um, but I never wanted, I mean, even the wise men in all of their silks and finery are quite exotic. But I never wanted to be a smelly shepherd. Oh, but today I do. I want to be a shepherd. I want to hear the words of the angel and I want to be so caught up in the excitement and overwhelmed with praise that I cannot keep the news to myself. That the truth of who this baby is will again cause me to be so excited. That the saviour of the whole world has been born. Oh God, stir my heart to excitement. Cause me to be overwhelmed with praise. Give me the courage to tell everyone who will listen how incredible this night is, how awesome this baby is, and that through him, the way back to God will be opened up. A forgiveness and grace and mercy are available through him, and anyone who believes in him will be saved. Hallelujah. I love you so much. Oh, church, that we could catch some of that excitement.
Oh, church, that we could be filled with that urgency to tell the world of this, uh, this amazing news of this saviour of the whole world has been born. No longer do we have to stumble about in the darkness. The light of the world has come. No longer do we pray to a distant God, but we have Emmanuel, God with us. And you see, the shepherds don't go telling people about what they'd seen and heard out of some sense of duty or because their very diligent and wonderful pastor had told them to, but because they'd seen for themselves and were so excited and so convinced that they couldn't help but tell everyone who would listen what they'd seen and heard. People must have thought they were insane because quite frankly, it is insane. Are we scared that people will think we're insane? What are we worried about, church? Has the message become so normal to us that the excitement has gone? Oh, Lord, fill us with your insanity, the insanity that the saviour of the world has been born to a virgin. Oh, Lord, and that she gave birth to God himself, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and laid him in an animal feeding trough. It is quite frankly insane, but it is true. Will we, like the shepherds, see clearly all of the signs and be so convinced and so excited that the saviour of the world has been born that we won't be able to help ourselves, that we will tell everyone we meet what we've seen and heard? Will we so overflow with excitement and joy and love for the world that we will want to share this incredible news? Oh God, I want to be a shepherd. Shall we pray, church? Father, I thank you for your word to us this morning. Thank you that you came for everyone, from the richest king to the poorest shepherd. Thank you for those first shepherds on that hill who became the first evangelists, telling everyone of the birth of Jesus, that the Messiah, the Saviour, had been born. Thank you for their excitement, for their belief, for their conviction. Father, will you also reignite my excitement, my belief and my conviction that I also will become an evangelist for you, telling everyone of the awesomeness of Christmas, that God is with us, that the saviour of the whole world has been born. Oh Lord, will you fill us with your Holy Spirit? Will you reinvigorate us? Let those familiar words become as fresh and exciting and new as they were to those shepherds on the hillside. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, you were a bit slow that time. Amen. Amen. We're going to say the words of the grace to one another now, and then we're going to play a carol. And the carol is while shepherds watch their flocks by night. I mean, what else could we finish with after that? Um, and our uh, welcomers will invite you to leave during the last song. So please, I ask you, please do leave promptly and safely, keeping to all of the social distancing rules. Remember that we are in tier three. So keeping our distance and leaving promptly really is an act of love to the most vulnerable amongst us and those who are more nervous. And I will go straight upstairs and um, anyone that wants to join me for a cup of tea will be very welcome. But I also understand if you need to head off, that's not a problem. So let's say the words of the grace to one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. 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 So now we're going to listen to while well, shepherds watch their flocks by night. <laughs> 